This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. With the unending help of the Almighty, we begin this week's Parsha Podcast. It's year eight of the Parsha Podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is Yaakov Wolby. The email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. And I was thinking maybe this should be like the, the way we start the podcast. You know, it's always a little bit awkward. I hit record. The microphone is on. The tape is rolling, and I have to say something. I have to start off with something. I have to have a sentence to start. And you know, other podcasts, they have music, and you know that we're opposed to music. And we're violently opposed to ads. So how do you start? What's the first sentence? And it's very helpful to have some sort of intro. So I'm experimenting. Maybe we'll stick with this, this one, or maybe we'll write a new one. Maybe. Maybe we'll see. But regardless, enough of that. Let's begin the podcast. Today we're going to have four short but really fun segments. I actually had a fifth one, but it was 
not so short and not so fun. It was more useful. And it was, it was kind of long and life changing. But I'll tell you a secret. Now I'm recording. It's Wednesday night. And I always want to release the episode on Wednesday night. And usually I record it, try to record it earlier on in the week, you know, Monday or Tuesday or at the latest Wednesday morning slash afternoon. But as I mentioned last week, we traveled, we were in Canada. Sunday we flew to Newark and we only got back to Houston last night. So I'm scrambling. I'm scrambling to get this one off in time. So we had to punt the fifth segment, the really long one and the really life-changing one. We have to punt it to next year. Next year we'll change our lives. What's what's the big deal? You can't wait a year. We'll wait a year to change and change our lives. And now we'll have four short and fun segments. Let's begin. The Parsha, of course, is named after Yisro, Jethro. That's Moshe's father-in-law. And he arrives, and there's a very long narrative describing what happens. He arrives, and he has the red carpet rolled out for him. And um, he has a conversation with, with Moshe, and Moshe regales him with the stories. And there's a pronouncement, a very interesting pronouncement that Jethro makes. Verse 11 of chapter 18. Now I know, I'll tell you, Adati, now I know that God is greater than all the other gods, that the Almighty, that Hashem is greater than all the other gods. There's a fascinating comment here in Rashi. Jethro has been regaled with the story. He comes and he is rendezvousing with the nation at Mount Sinai, and he brings with him Moshe's wife, Zipporah, and Moshe's two sons. And he has a conversation, and he learns about the exploits, the escapades, the miracles, the wonders that happened to the nation. And he makes a pronouncement. And he says, now I know, now I know for sure, that God, that the Almighty, that the God of the Jews is greater than all the other gods. Now, if he knows this, Rashi observes, it must be that he can he can say that statement factually. Says Rashi, this teaches us, this verse teaches us, that Jethro had familiarity with every foreign god in the world. There was not a single idol that Jethro did not worship. So Jethro can legitimately say, can literally say, you know that term literally, he can literally say this is greater than all the other gods. Well, how do you know? Maybe there's some sort of foreign god, some deity, some pagan, some idol that's worshipped in some faraway place. Maybe that's the true one. If he says, now I know that the God of the Jews, the one omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God, invisible God, infinite God, this God is greater than all of them, it must be that he has experience with all of them. So Rashi tells us that Jethro experimented with every single idol in the world. There was not a single one that he ignored, that he did not worship. He experimented all of them. And now he is sharing his conclusions with us. Now I know for sure that this God is legit and greater than all the other ones. So the observation that I want to make here as segment one of this podcast is that Jethro, he's obviously a very unique figure in the Torah, but certainly if you think about the statement and the commentary here of Rashi, he's obviously someone who is very interested in theology, in finding the right religion and finding the right God. And he's very interested in in worship and service. So he's going to every single place and finding every single deity. We know that in antiquity, there were thousands of, of gods and religions. You can imagine what it's like to be Jethro. And he's going to every little place, traveling to every corner of the world, trying to discover, trying to find, trying to experiment with all these different deities. And each deity has their own way of worshiping it and their own, I'm not an expert, but their own mojo, their own vibe. And Jethro's going, traveling the whole world, worshiping every idol. And he's done every single one. And now he comes to God. And he comes to Sinai. And he comes to Torah. And he witnesses the nation. And he hears the exploits. And now he says, okay, I finally arrived at the truth. 
What's incredible about this to me is that he's experimented with all of them before he came to Almighty God and Torah. Jethro has experimented with every single one of the world's professed deities and idols and gods, and he comes to Torah and the Almighty God last. This is the very last one in his list. Now, the the tradition of God, of Almighty God, has been around for a very long time. Abraham existed hundreds of years before the events of this week's Parsha. There was always a cohort of people that were following, that were observing, that were submitting themselves to this one invisible God. And somehow, if you just do the math here, Jethro arrives at this at the very end of his journey. Is it a weird coincidence that the very last religion, the very last way of worshiping a higher being, the very last one that he experiments is the truth? What are the odds? If you say, let's make a spreadsheet here. We love spreadsheets at the Torch Center. Make a spreadsheet of the world's, you know, the top 50,000 religions. And let's experiment. You know, Jethro's a truth seeker. He wants to find out the truth. And he's dedicated and he's committed. He'll travel wherever he needs to go. What are the odds that the truth one is at the very end? It's the last one that he, that he experiments with. If the options were evenly distributed, you would imagine it would be somewhere in the middle. I think there's a, a powerful observation that we can make from here. There is a factor that is very central to our life, to our religious life. There is a force. We talk, we, we talk about this all the time. It's called the Yitzhahara. There is a force that the Almighty created that's designed, it's engineered to try to prevent us from achieving the truth. And this is the force that's called the foreign god because its goal is to create alternatives to obviate the need for Almighty God. To create all sorts of ways that a person can be obscured from the truth, can be removed from the truth. And therefore, it's not going to be random. If a person is just going to make a list, the Yetzirah will ensure that the very last one is going to be the truth. All the other fake deities, all the other falsehoods that the Yetzirah is designed to encourage, they will be elevated to the top. The truth will be discouraged. All the other systems, all the other modes of worship that are fake, that's right, the wheel has the Yetzirah, they'll all be encouraged and they'll all rise to the surface. They'll all be promoted. The very last thing that you will find, if you're just looking randomly, it's going to be the hardest one. It's not going to draw you in initially. The Yetzirah will do whatever it can to avoid, to make you avoid looking its in its direction. That's Torah. There's a Midrash that we've cited many times here on the Parsha podcast that talks about the two paths. One path is very pleasant and appealing and alluring and it's so exciting and it seems so inviting. It seems pleasant. And you can't see past the bend in, in the road, but whatever you could see looks amazing. And the second path, it looks scary, it's daunting, it's foreboding, it's ominous. And you also can't see, you know, beyond the bend of, of that path. But you have to choose a path. And there's a wise man. And the wise man is telling you, choose the scary, daunting path. Because right, right past that bend, right where you cannot see it anymore, it gets very pleasant. And it's pleasant all the way through. Whereas the path that seems initially pleasant, that's initially inviting, once you get past that bend, it gets treacherous and, and dangerous and scary and painful and uneven, unpleasant. That is the model of us making choices in life. The Yitzhah makes the bad path, the false path, the path that leads towards unpleasant 
places, places that will not ultimately lead to a fulfilling life, to a life of, of, of deep connection, to a life that our soul is nourished. Our eternal halves are given sustenance. That path will initially seem very appealing. And the path that will ultimately bring us to where we need to go, that will seem to be very daunting. It will seem to be very unpleasant. And if we're experimenting randomly, that's the last one that we'll choose. So as we know, this is the theme of year eight of the Parsha podcast. We're going a little bit deeper, you know, deep and deeper. You, you pull out this insight. Rashi already does all the, most of the work for us. Jethro is making a pronouncement. Now I know something. That the God of the Jews... That's greater. This God is greater than all other gods. Rashi tells us he's tried every single one of them, and we can observe from that he's coming to this last. That's a very powerful insight. We're not going to stumble onto the truth. you got to work really hard to get it. The path of Torah, it's very demanding, and it requires a degree of commitment and, and buy-in and we're going to have to overcome the resistance, the obstacles that are placed in our way by the Sahara. It's not going to initially be appealing. Well, maybe if someone has a very special soul, or if someone's an, an unusually committed truth seeker, or of course if someone was fortunate enough to be raised with Torah. The late, great the friend of the podcast, Dr. Jenikov used to say, Judaism, we need better marketing. You know, there's a billion Muslims and there's a billion Christians and there used to be a billion communists. All these other ways of life, they have billions of adherents. And what do we have? You know, it's like a rounding error in the, in the population statistics demographics of the world. Here's the answer. Falsehoods of all varieties, they have an appeal that we can never have. Or... More precisely, we can only have once the Yetzirah is eliminated. So yes, maybe we can improve on the branding and the marketing. But that's only going to help on the margins. How hard was it for Abraham to discover the truth? How much do they have to overcome? We're lucky that we're, to one extent or the other, we're on the inside. You know, we're, we're here, we're studying Torah together. But we have to remember, this is not... Self-understood, if we went the path of Jethro, a truth seeker, a hero in the Torah, the eponymous figure of the Parsha of the most significant event in the history of humanity, the revelation at Sinai in our Parsha. If we went the way of, jo- of Jethro, we'll arrive at Torah at the very end. That's a powerful insight, and that is segment number one of this week's Parsha podcast. Let's go to segment number two. This is perhaps the most useful comment in Rashi's commentary on the Torah. After Jethro departs, we have the Sinai revelation. And chapter 19 is all the preparations that were done ahead of time. And Moshe is doing some shuttle diplomacy going back and forth between the nation and God and giving the nation the terms, and telling them what they need to know, and telling them what is in store for them at the Sinai Revelation. And of course, we've talked about that many times on the Parsha podcast. But in verse 5 of chapter 19, we have Moshe laying out what is going to be the process, so to speak, of Sinai. And he starts off and he tells them, if you hearken to my words, and of course, he's representing God. If you hearken to my words, to my voice, and you observe and you guard my covenant, you will be, for me, a cherished people. You'll be the chosen people. The pact of Sinai. It's us accepting the Almighty's Torah and really accepting it blindly. And we had to say, we will do and we will listen. We signed the line that is dotted without knowing all the terms, without reading the fine print. 
But Moshe tells us we'll be God's chosen nation, we'll be a cherished people. But Rashi's comment, it's one of the most iconic comments, and it's very useful, as we shall see. If any one of us had the great privilege of spending time in yeshiva, you have surely heard this many, many times in the tenure, in your tenure in yeshiva. Rashi says, Rashi interprets Moshe's words, that Moshe is saying an if-then statement. If now, before Sinai, you accept upon yourselves all the terms of Sinai, all the laws, the covenant, all the details that are going to be conveyed at Sinai. Then you will be a cherished people, meaning then you will have the pleasure henceforth. Why? Because all beginnings are difficult. Rashi seems to be bothered by the fact that Moshe is telling the nation, if you accept the loss and you hearken to my words and you guard the covenant. That comes later. So Rashi is interpreting as, as saying that Moshe is proposing to the nation, if you just accept upon yourself, you commit yourself to it, then you'll have the result, which is you'll be the cherished people, meaning you'll have a life that is replete with the pleasure of being the cherished people of God, and then Rashi ends, Shekal haschalos kashos, because all beginnings are difficult. So this is an iconic idea because when you're starting any initiative, it's going to be difficult. And Rashi tells us all beginnings are difficult. And it starts off with a commitment. And if you have that commitment, then it'll be pleasurable for you going forward. So there's a few interesting observations that we have to make in this segment number two of Parshas Yisro, five, seven, eight, four, year eight of the Parsha podcast. If you read this comment in Rashi carefully, Rashi seems to be referencing the idea that we said earlier. Maybe this is the overarching theme of the Parsha. The path to Torah is difficult. It's not easy. Jethro got there at the very end. And that's not a coincidence. But you should know that, you know, this, this, this path that, you, that seems to be very difficult in the future, once you get over a certain hump, it's actually the more pleasurable path. But if you, if you examine Rashi very carefully, he seems to be conflating the beginning and the end with the difficulty and the sweetness. You know, if I were to say, what's the opposite of difficult? You would say, easy. It's, it's hard or it's easy. The term that Rashi uses is one of sweetness. Rashi says, if you accept upon yourself the Torah now, it'll be pleasurable, it'll be sweet for you going forward. Why? Because all beginnings are difficult. The continuation, not the beginning. After the beginning is over, well, then it's not difficult. Barashi is transitioning from saying that the beginning will be difficult to saying that the end will be pleasurable. The antonym of difficult is not sweet or, or pleasurable. You know, it's sweet versus bitter and hard versus easy. So one observation we can make from this Rashi is that Rashi is not saying that the path of Torah, it's hard and then it gets easy. That's not what Moshe is proposing to the Jewish people. It's hard, and it will remain hard. It's very demanding, and it will always remain demanding. Even Moshe, the greatest of all men. His life, it was constantly dynamic. He was always growing in his spiritual standing. It doesn't get easy. If it gets easy, maybe you're not pushing hard enough. But there's two types of hard. There's two types of difficulty. There's the one where it's difficult and bitter, and that's only at the beginning. When 
A person starts, it's difficult, and you don't see the fruits of your labor. There's no feedback loop that makes it worth it initially. And that's what Rashi's telling us. It starts off, it's hard, without any pleasure. It's not sweet. When you continue, you immerse yourself in Torah, it actually gets even harder, you can argue. Because now you're seeing more of the grand, infinite scope of Torah. But you see the sweetness and the pleasure. That's a very powerful insight. And I think anyone who has had the great privilege of spending some time studying Torah, you know that if you're doing it properly, it's going to be difficult. But the pleasure that someone has while studying Torah is unmatched by any other pleasure. The Rambam calls this kind of pleasure the highest level of pleasure that's conceivable to a human. And anyone who's had the great fortune of spending time in yeshiva and trying to immerse yourself on the deepest level for a very long time, studying Talmud or the commentaries, and working really hard and achieving a certain hara, a certain eureka, a certain pay dirt, the pleasure that that bestows upon a person is unrivaled. It's unmatched. So yes, the path is hard. And it will remain such. And that's good. Because what you're, what are you here to do? You're relaxed when you're dead. You're here to work. And what's the best, most enjoyable, most rewarding type of work? That's how Moshe's telling the Jewish people. The work that bestows pleasure. And yes, in the beginning, it's not so appetizing. It's not so appealing. Jethro, after all, got there at the very end. All told, if we just evaluate the beginning, this is the hardest beginning. But this is the one that brings the most enjoyment to the person who is fortunate enough to immerse themselves in it. Now, there's another point here in this, in this comment here in Rashi. Rashi is highlighting the pleasure, the sweetness of Torah. That's part of the pitch. Moshe is making a pitch. It's so sweet. It's so pleasurable. My grandfather, a blessed memory, he used to say that people think, erroneously, that our argument with other systems of living is that they want pleasure and we don't want pleasure. He says, no, that's that's totally wrong. Humans are pleasure-seeking machines. And this is something that we accept. The most basic instinct of a person is to seek pleasure. The only difference that we have with other systems of living is the nature in which a person is choosing to seek pleasure. You know, someone could want very physical pleasures like food or, I don't know, a massage or games. Someone's a bit more sophisticated. They want honor and prestige and standing and stature, of course, assets. And if someone is more more spiritual, they want more spiritual pleasures, self-perfection, self-refinement, caring for others. What do we say? We want Olam Abba. That's the highest level of pleasure. What's the level of pleasure of Olam Abba? It's to enjoy, to bask in the eternal pleasure of God. But pleasure is really what we're all seeking across the board. And here Rashi is telling us that when Moshe is is giving the nation the terms of Sinai, he's highlighting the fact that the beginning is hard, but the continuation is pleasurable. Now, the word that Rashi uses, there there are many words that mean pleasure in Hebrew, but this particular word is ye'erav, v'ha'arevna which is a 
Interesting word because the word, the, the root of that word, it also means to mix. Le'arev, to, to mix. Le'arbev as well. So there's a word in Hebrew that means pleasure and also means mixture. My grandfather, Blessed Memory, used to say that this is really the, the proper term to describe the pleasure of Torah. The level of pleasure or the type of pleasure that it really bestows upon a person is when it melds with them. It blends with them. It becomes part of them. And that's really what Moshe's, or part of the message that Moshe is, is conveying to the Jewish people. This path that I'm proposing, this bargain that I'm offering you, this revelation that God has on the table for you, it's going to give you a kind of pleasure that's going to fit very, very, very well with your essence. It's going to blend. It's going to meld. It's going to fuse with you in a very natural way. I had the great privilege of spending time in yeshiva. I wasn't that studious. I wasn't that diligent. There were students there that were like so committed, so in love with learning. I always like to ask yeshiva students, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a student in the yeshiva. Wow, fantastic. Do you enjoy studying Talmud? Which is what they do 10, 11, 12, 13, 18 hours a day. And it's a, it's a bizarre question because no one asks that question because, you know, if you're a yeshiva student, that's what you do. Do you enjoy it? And some people say, like, the instinct is to say, well, of course, I'm studying the Amayis Torah on the highest level, the Talmud. But then you have the honest ones who say, well, I don't really enjoy it, but I do it because I have to do it because it's the Amayis Torah. Or I enjoy parts of it. Or I enjoy it after some time. I had one, my, my, my favorite answer. I think I might have mentioned this in the podcast. He said, that I don't really enjoy studying, but I really, really, really don't enjoy not studying, which I thought was a very clever answer. Because when when someone's a student at the yeshiva and they really develop a taste for Torah, and they have a day or two or three or a week, God forbid, where they're not studying, they have like this feeling of emptiness that really is it's kind of existentially painful. You see some students that are just madly in love with studying the Almighty's Torah. And that's because there is a type of pleasure that it conveys. That's that pleasure where it really clicks with a person. And of course, everyone has to find their little corner of Torah that really speaks to them. Talmud tells us that you have to study what your heart desires. Everyone has a different soul. And everyone's soul feels a certain predisposition, a certain affinity for a different part of Torah. Not to say that some parts of Torah are better than others, but some part really connects with you in a way that others don't. And that's because your soul is a recipient of a particular type of Torah. And at Sinai, there were 600,000 revelations, individual, distinct, discrete revelations of Sinai, of Torah. Every soul got their own little portion. And when you find a, a part of Torah, a discipline of Torah study that really connects with you, that really melds with you, it really clicks with you, that's your part of Torah. You have to grab onto it. And even that will be hard. Of course, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be worth it. But that's the type of pleasure that Rashi is telling us, that Rashi's, the word that Rashi is choosing, and that's really very pertinent to us, of course, as well, because we are trying to accept the Torah on our own in our lives, and we're going to mimic some of the decisions that the Jewish people made before Sinai. Now, segment three, there was someone who was visiting the Houston community, 
he was here fundraising for an institution in Jerusalem. And it was Parshas Yisro last year. And he's like, oh, I have this incredible idea on in the Parsha. Can I share it with you? I said, yeah, of course. All ideas in the Parsha, share with me. I need it. I have a Parsha podcast after all. It's year eight. I don't like repeating content. Give it all to me. Send it to me. Rabbi Wolbegym.com. So he says something unbelievable. I put it in my notes and now I have it here. I'm going to share it with you. Before Sinai, there is a theme that's repeated again and again. And that is that during the revelation, this mountain will temporarily become elevated. It will become transformed. And anyone who touches this mountain, gets too close, will be in grave danger. And again, this is repeated, where the Almighty tells Moshe to go warn and warn and warn and warn the people to not get too close, to not encroach upon the mountain, because otherwise you will die. And one of those verses in ch- is in chapter 19, verse 23 of the book of Exodus. And again, the verse tells us that Moshe responds to God. I know, I told the nation. They're not going to go up the mountain because you warned us. You conveyed this testament to us. Hagbel esahar v'kidashto. Make a boundary for the mountain and sanctify it. So this is again part of the dialogue, part of the shuttle diplomacy. Moshe is talking to God in preparation for the sign of revelation of our Parsha. Says the visitor from Jerusalem, whose name I don't know. He says that a mountain in our philosophy it's sometimes synonymous with the Yetzahara, with the aforementioned evil inclination. You recall, perhaps, the Talmud tells us that in the future, the Almighty will slaughter the Yetzahara, and it will appear to some as a mountain, and to others it will appear as a strand of hair. So there is a precedent to this idea that a mountain is symbolic of the Yetzahara. And what does God Tell Moshe, what does Moshe instruct the people? To set boundaries to the mountain and sanctify it. When you set boundaries to the mountain, when you set boundaries to the Yetzirah, says this visitor from Jerusalem, then you've sanctified it. Then there's holiness. The Yetzirah, we always malign it. We always talk about how dangerous and how it could lead us to bad places and so on. But of course, we also know that the Midrash tells us that the Yetzirah is tov ma'od. It's exceedingly good. And this verse, perhaps on a deeper level, on a homiletical, allegorical level, it's hinting at this idea that you have to set boundaries to the mountain, set boundaries to the Yetzirah. And then... There's holiness. Then there is sanctification. The Yitzhak with moderation in small doses, with limits. That's actually a recipe for holiness. And then he says something unbelievable. The word for mountain in Hebrew is har. Hey and resh, two letters, har. So you have har Sinai, Mount Sinai. Har Moria, Mount Mori, which is, of course, Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and so on. Har, hey, resh, two letters. The verse says, Hagbel as our make boundaries to the mountain. What are the boundaries of the word har, mountain? The letter hey, it's the fifth letter of the alphabet, of the aleph base. So what are its boundaries? Well, the Dalad comes before it. That's the fourth one. And the Vav comes after it. That's the sixth one. So the, the boundary, so to speak, of the first letter of mountain, of Har, is Dalad. 
and Vav. Well, the second letter of the word Har, meaning mountain, it's, it's a Resh. And what are the letters that come before and after it? What are the boundaries of the letter Resh? Well, that's a Kuf that comes before it and a Shin that comes after it. So what are the boundaries of a Har? What are the boundaries of a mountain? What are the letters that precede and succeed the letters He and Resh? It's a Dalad and a Vav and a Kuf and a Shin. Those four letters spell Kadosh, meaning holy. What an insight. What a clever insight. Deep and deeper. Hagbel Sahar, make boundaries for Har, make boundaries for the mountain. Make boundaries for the Yitzhara. And the actual boundaries of these letters spell out Kadosh. And of course, this is a very useful idea. We don't believe in total asceticism. We don't believe in trying to run away from the Eight Sahara, to try to banish it. Oh no. The Talmud tells us, if the Eight Sahara attacks you, drag it to the base matrish. Don't punch it in the nose and leave it there and flee from it. Take it with you. Because if you have certain boundaries to the Eight Sahara, the Eight Sahara in moderation, the Eight Sahara in a targeted application, then actually it's Kadosh. It is Holiness, the mountain with boundaries, that is holiness. And finally, segment number four. And I will tell you that just as the visitor from Jerusalem gave me an assist with segment number three this past week, I told you I had some traveling. So Thursday we went to Toronto and uh, we had the Afraf, which... I don't really know what it means. It's, I think it's a Yiddish word. But it's basically a Jewish bachelor party where the the groom says goodbye to his family, the Shabbos before the wedding. And there's uh, lots of celebrations and they throw candy at him. And it's a very nice celebration. I'm not going to tell you what I said in my speech on Shabbos morning. But I will say it was very well received, but it has nothing to do with our parsha, And it's not something I'm going to share with you right now. You had to be there. You had to be there to know what it was, what it was like. All the jokes that I made, all the inside jokes. But then on Sunday, we flew to Newark and the wedding was in New Jersey. So we went to the wedding on Monday evening. And at this wedding, of course, I'm meeting all these people and met some family and some friends and some new friends and some old friends. Got into a really nice, vigorous argument with one of the yeshiva students that was there. Uh, they had an open bar for whatever reason. So this this student, he was highly inebriated. As you know, I don't drink. I didn't even have a single, nothing, nothing. This kid, God bless him. He was drinking, so we were chatting. We had all these arguments. And I was bringing all my evidence, of course, to support my claim and um anyhow, he's not gonna listen to this. He doesn't he doesn't have any internet. He doesn't even have a phone. But I said, we have to debate this further. <laughs> we were getting into all these fun debates. I, I, I love arguing. What can I do? I, I want to debate. There's nothing that I enjoy more. And to have a really real yeshiva student who's like totally immersed in the yeshiva. And he's telling me the book of Talmud he's studying. And I'm like, wow, I love that book of Talmud. I want to argue with you about it. And then we got into some other arguments. I said, take my phone number. Call me up from the payphone in the yeshiva. Let's have a few debates. Anyhow, put that aside. I had a conversation with Mr. David Botnick. Now, you know the name Botnick. My brother-in-law, Rabbi Shmuley Botnick. We married sisters. So he, of course, was by the wedding. He was by the orphan as well. But his father, because he, his son married the, into this family, he, he decided that he's coming to the wedding as well. Very nice. So we sat down at the smorgasbord and we're chatting. And he's like, are you still doing the podcast? Of course I'm still doing the podcast. It's like, yeah, well, it's, you know, every week yeah, I do a Parsha podcast. I said, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great pleasure. It's a great privilege. It's a lot of work, a lot of responsibility. We're just having some chit chat. And I said to him, listen, you know, last week I spoke about the bones of Joseph. 
It's only one verse in the whole parsha. There's more than a hundred verses. So you may, may, maybe we could do the seventy years of it. If every if every if every year we speak about one verse, we don't have to repeat content for the next seventy, eighty, a hundred years. With the help of the Almighty, we'll be able to live that long. So we're chatting. He's like, "Oh, bones of Joseph. Let me tell what I think about the bones of Joseph." So he shares something really cool about the bones of Joseph. Why was Joseph so insistent about having his bones be taken? Why is there an emphasis on the bones of Joseph? And of course, we talked about this last week, but he shares something novel. He said that the Talmud tells us that the bones of someone who is envious, those bones rot. It's really a verse in Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 30, that when someone's envious, their bones will become brittle, they'll rot. But if someone's not envious then their bones will not rot. So Joseph really wanted to display, to demonstrate, to manifest, to show all that there was no envy between him and his brothers. They were all united. And his pacification of his brothers was genuine, that he really had nothing against them. And they the same towards him. And therefore, there was an emphasis to bring the bones, to show that the bones are solid and robust and not brittle and not falling apart to show that this family was really united. That's what Mr. Botnick shared with me. So let's think about this a little bit more. You know, last week we spoke about the fact that the bones of Joseph were very pivotal for the nation in the wilderness. But we also mentioned the Midrash that says that the splitting of the sea, it only happened thanks to the bones of Joseph. Because the verse tells us that the sea saw and split. Well, what did it see? It saw the bones of Joseph. Well, why? Because Joseph, when he fled from the wife of Potiphar, when she prepositioned him, it's the verse says, Vayanas, Vayetzachutza, Vayanas, the word Vayanas. And the sea, Hayam Ra'a Vayanas, the sea also fled. And thus the Midrash connects these two, the bones of Joseph, that triggered the sea to split. So, the fact that Mr. Botnick is telling me that the bones of Joseph are symbolic of the unity that happened or that existed between Joseph and his brothers, I want to suggest the following. The sea split, the Midrash tells us, because of the bones of Joseph. Now that we know the bones of Joseph embody, they symbolized the unity that existed between Joseph and his brothers, thanks to Mr. Botnick. Maybe this tells us that if you want to split the sea, you have to be united. Only when a people, when a force is united as one, only then can other things be fractured, be split. And now I'm sitting here on the podcast. I'm in the Torch Center by myself. And it's late Wednesday night and I had another idea just as I'm speaking to you. Huh. Wow. This is what happens when you don't prepare. When you don't prepare, the ideas come to you with the help of the Almighty as you're recording. Wow. Listen to this. And again, I apologize for this being a bit more haphazard than we typically do here on the Parsha Podcast. I'm just remembering right now, the Midrash tells us that there were two people who were not part of the splitting of the sea. They remained in Egypt, and then they rejoined the nation. And they are Dathan and Abiram, the two rabble-rousers that cause all sorts of problems for the Jewish people, and ultimately die in the sinkhole of Korach. Wow. Maybe the reason why they could not be alongside the Jewish people, is because if they were there, they could not be united, could not have this experience of unity amongst the people, and thus the the sea would not split if they were there. Wow. Because the the Midrash does tell us, in addition to that, that when Dathan and Abiram finally left Egypt, the sea split for them too, just those two people, the sea split for them. They were united with each other. They were united 
in pursuit of, of bad aims, of bad goals, but they were united and a united force will split the sea. But if they had been perhaps with the Jewish people in totality with the rest of the Jewish people, because they were always distinct from the rest of the people, they were always rabble-rousers causing problems, raising problems and dispute and discord amongst the nation, well, maybe that would have prevented the sea from splitting. Anyhow, but hear me out. Hear me out. Hear, hear me out. There's another splitting that happens in this week's Parsha. We have the splitting of the sea last week's Parsha. The bones of Joseph contributing to that. And that, of course, is an incredible miracle. And we revisit, revisit it every day with the prayers. But there's another splitting in this which Parsha. Huh. Do you know what I'm talking about? The sea split again. Not, not quite the sea, though. Something similar to the sea split in this is Parsha. Take a look at Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. The verse says, Ata haresa ladas, you were shown to, to know that Hashem, He's the God, and there's nothing else beside Him. This is a reference to the Sinai revelation that happens in our Parsha. And Rashi in his comment tells us, what does it mean that you were shown to see? That there's nothing besides for God. God is the only one. Says Rashi, citing from the Midrash. When the Almighty gave the Torah to the Jewish people at the Sinai revelation, he opened up before them the seven heavens. And just as he tore open, so to speak, the upper spheres, he also tore open the lower spheres. The nation was given a window, a portal, a viewing of all the heavens, the upper ones, the lower ones, it was completely open before them. And they saw, they witnessed, they visualized, so to speak, that he is the only one, that God is the only one. And thus the verse says, Atahareslas, you were shown to know. You were shown, and now you know this that God, He's the only one. Ain od Milvado, there's nothing besides for him. There's no other power besides for God. Now, if you read this Rashi, Rashi says that God tore open. The, the word for splitting of the sea is Kriyas Yamsov, the tearing of the sea, the ripping of the sea. That same word here is used in Rashi's comment to Devarim. Chapter 4, verse 35, God tore open the heavens. So in last week's Parsha, Parsha's Peshalach, there was the tearing of the sea. In this week's Parsha, there's another split, the splitting not of the sea, but of the heavens. Now, which one of them is more significant? I don't know. Which one of them is harder to pull off? I don't know either. But here's what I know. Thanks to Rabbi Botnick's father, Mr. Botnick, who flew in to join the festivities, and he noted that the bones of Joseph symbolized the unity that existed amongst Joseph and his brothers. And I want to suggest on top of Mr. Botnick's uh, insight, an addendum, that maybe that's why the sea split because of the bones of Joseph, because of the unity that existed. The Jewish people absent Dathan and Abiram, the troublemakers, the infamous, notorious troublemakers. There was such unity, it split the sea. And our Parsha, Rashi tells us, chapter 19, verse 2, the Jewish people left for freedom and they came to Mount Sinai. And they encamped in the wilderness. And Israel encamped opposite the mountain. And Rashi notes that there's a change from plural to singular. Vayachanu, which means they plural encamped, Vayichan, and he encamped. So Rashi, of course, notices that there is a change from plural to singular. Rashi explains that at Sinai, they were ke'ish echad belev echad, they were like one person with one heart. Here's the idea. The bones of Joseph, that's what split the sea. The bones of Joseph, Mr. Botnick tells us, that symbolizes the unity they're all united. How do you split the sea? If you're united, you split the sea. If you're fractured, if you're split yourself, you cannot split others. 
How do you split the heavens? How do you tear apart the seven spheres of heaven, the lower ones, the upper ones? Only if you're united as one. The Sensei, Taekwondo, Jiu-Jitsu, the masters. They're able to shatter the stone, break the boards. They can use the, the katana, the samurai, to slice through all the wood in one fell swoop. Great boxers. They know how to concentrate all their energy at a single point. You take all the energy and you condense it to one point. And when you do that, everything splits. If you're disjointed, if you're scattered, then the power is going to be distributed as well. And you won't be able to split other things. We have great accomplishments of our nation. The splitting of the sea, the splitting of the heavens. And those happened only when we were united. We had the bones of Joseph to symbolize this unity. We did not have Dathan and Abiram. We left them in Egypt. And that's how we were able to split the sea. In our parasha, we split the heavens. How did we split the heavens? We were like one man with one heart. This is the imperative to unite, to be on the same page, to be bound to each other. If we want to batter through all the resistance that we have to overcome to accomplish our national mission, but like in a steel cage that's keeping us from our mission, we have to split our way through it. We've got to break out of the prison. We have to find a point where we could concentrate all of our efforts. We have to unite to such a degree that we're just completely in sync with each other, completely operating as one, like one man with one heart. At the sea, Jewish people were united. Of course, we had Joseph's extraordinary magnanimity and, of course, his, his faith and how he forgave his brothers, notwithstanding their egregious wrongdoing. And he said, this is the handiwork of God, not you. At the splitting of the sea, we also had Pharaoh bearing down upon us. We thought we we're all going to die. Those, of course, unite people that would otherwise be very different. Unite them together. At Sinai, we were all there, committed to the same ideal, committed to the same goal, eager to accept the same Torah. We became like one man with one heart. And that power can tear apart the, the oceans below, the seas below, the resistance below, and the heavens below, the heavens above, the seven heavens that is the power of a united front. May we be so fortunate to be united with each other, with our brethren. Of course, at this time, we think, and we never stop thinking, but our brothers and sisters living in tremendous pain, in tremendous danger. Of course, you know, the news coming in from Israel, every day it's terrifying what we're going to learn about what happened today. And we hope and pray that we're able to overcome that resistance. And all of our oppressors and all of our enemies, we can shatter and, and, and destroy and split them like we split the sea, split them like, like we split the heaven. And one way to do that is when we are united as one. If we accept, this is the Parsha, really, to accept the Torah. It's hard. It's difficult. The path is foreboding. It's ominous, it's scary, it's uneven, it doesn't seem to be so appealing. And the beginnings, well, they're hard, they're difficult. But if we unite under, under this banner and commit ourselves to this, nothing will stop us. There is no difficulty that will match the difficulty of the Jewish people in our Parsha to try to open up the heavens. Open up the heavens! Think about what that means. Have God descend upon the mountain and him open up the heavens and give us everything. We did that. We can overcome the present challenges that we face. May we only hear good news from each other and from the rest of our brethren. It's 
Your aid of the Parsha podcast is Parsha's Yisro. I know this was a little bit of a different vibe than we typically do because I had less time to prepare. You know what? You might like it even better. Let me know. The image that says, Rabbi, what would you want to come? Have an incredible day. Splendid, splendid, splendid. Shabbos, restful one, uplifting one, invigorating one, inspiring one. And please, God, with the unending help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week. The email address is rabbiwalbachimel.com.